last video we covered the classical art of memory and we left off at the point in our story when Rome had just fell and the memory arts had become rekindled in the growing Catholic Church. Early church fathers, such as Saint Augustine, who was born around 430 years AD, were well trained in the classical art of memory for their rhetorical speech making. And there were some texts which survived the fall of Rome, which really did describe the techniques of the memory art in detail. One of the most influential being Rhetorica ad Herenium, speech making for Henry. This text really went in depth when it came to the whole creation of a memory palace. It described how you should choose a location, a building that's not too big, not too small, that has architectural features which make good locations like uh, pillars or arches. It talks about making sure that that building that you choose, if it's a real one, should be outside town so there aren't many people there. And that you should Make sure the lighting isn't too bright and isn't too dark when you walk around so you can really fix that building in your memory. This text also outlines how you can use pictures and images as memory palaces. There are also philosophical writings such as those of Aristotle that covered the art of memory in a, a more thoughtful uh, manner and really went in depth as to how the, the mind worked in terms of recalling things. We see the art of memory is very important in uh, this early Christian church from the, the writings at the time. In fact, St Augustine himself talks about how in the spacious fields of his memory, so this is his, his memory palaces are, are outside, and he talks about how when he goes into these uh, palaces, he finds the thing that he can't recall from experience. He actually finds divinity. And it's this new and mystical feel uh, that characterises the Christian art of memory from then on. The focus moves away from speech making although it is still used uh, for making speeches. But the focus moves from a rhetoric to prudence. Now the memory art is about transforming your character. There is a strong conviction that whatever you put in your mind becomes you. So memory palaces start to become based around biblical lessons and places. We see whole manuals which are based on the wings of an angel and a picture of the angel that you will memorise and every single feather has one of the most important points in your path of salvation. We see mysterious looking images which are an epitome, a summary of the whole of each one of the Gospels. Any building mentioned in the Bible uh, King Solomon's temple, uh, the tabernacle, uh, Noah's ark, anything that can be used as a memory palace is used. We even see the coat of many colours and the breastplate of Aaron and they're used creatively both for sermons but also uh, to form moral lessons which are going to transform you in uh, your nature. As time goes on this art of memory for self-transformation becomes perfected with a great degree of beauty and accuracy. 
St Albert the Great writes about how in Aristotle you can read that the human mind can't think of anything without an image forming. So you should make sure that those images that you recall are virtuous and good and positive. He even goes as far as researching which images work best and how this mechanism works. So what he says is, is if you remember an image with a great uh, focus, um, if you practice your meditatio, your meditation on a memory image, to the degree that you connect with it fully, this causes a transformation in your character in the same way that a big experience does. So the actual example he uses is if you get bitten by a wolf, you don't need to learn. That goes straight into your deep mind, into what he called your estimative ability. And this is um, your animal instincts. And the same is true with a memory image that is formed with great intensity. So we can see this mechanism is something very interesting and something that some people watching this video will already be aware of. In the Oriental teachings, in yoga and Buddhism, there's this idea of Samadhi or Satori. So their meditation does lead to a oneness which is meant to bring the same kind of transformation of self. It's just that memory uses an image which is built up. So your focus is kept by detail. So you have a, an image of an angel of truth. An angel has lots and lots of detail that allows you to connect with it and really rest your mind on this concept of truth for a long time. Maybe every piece of clothing represents a gift of truth. Everything they hold represents a blessing that truth brings. So by resting your mind on this level of detail and remembering poems and a certain bits of information connected with truthful action, you can become at one with it. Now, Albert the Great student, uh, St Thomas Aquinas, he felt that the best form of images for this kind of transformation are what he called uh, corporeal similitudes. That would be anthropomorphized images, images of people. So if you take a vow, he said to stop this vow slipping from your consciousness, you need a figure to associate it with, which could be an ideal person who really managed to do that, an angel, a virtue, some image that allowed you to remember it. Now this Christian art of memory became ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Churches were laid out with this in mind. Stained glass windows were there as a teaching aid for those who couldn't read. Statues that represented the virtues so you could contemplate them. It was everywhere. We even see uh, it being used as a means to help people with their problems. So. If you went to someone who was wise in this form of spiritual training and you told them you suffered from anxiety, they could give you a picture or show you a stained glass window or a statue or something which really had the characteristics of tranquility to it. And you'd be taught your meditatio, your contemplatio, you'd be taught how to go through each detail in your mind and memorise the sermons or the poems associated with it so you could dwell on calmness to bring around that tranquility. And images were actually made for this purpose. And as time went on, uh, we actually see the production of books, both religious and uh, for the... Uh, general use of uh, the literate nobility, which involve the use of memory. So we see things like um, Besteries. Besteries is a, a book which is full of uh, different uh, images of animals and there's normally a moral lesson or a funny story about each one. But you memorise them so that you've got a, a listing system. So if um, 
you need to remember something. You've got uh, exciting, exotic animals uh, that you'd never see in Europe there to use as hooks. So you've got a giraffe, you've got an elephant, you've got a leopard, uh, maybe a snake. And if you need to remember a list, you connect them with an uh, exciting image or a story. So you can imagine if it was a list of food, you can imagine each animal eating one of the items. This was a fun way to remember things. We also see books start to appear called emblem books. Uh, you can see that these are a bit like uh, stained glass windows, but more detailed. They're very much like tracing boards, if you're aware of these. And this would be a book for your contemplation. And the idea was to memorise everything there and clearly visualise, but also to work out the puzzles and puns and insights that could be gained. You could, uh, this would lead you to your enlightenment. And there were different ones with different things. So if you had a problem with a vice, there'd be something that would allow you to reflect on that virtue and transform yourself. Within spiritual communities, within uh, monasteries, abbeys, convents, the most mystical forms of the art of memory uh, were practised. Sometimes these were in-depth reflections on a spiritual occurrence or image from the Bible with every detail having deep meaning. And this could lead to great ecstatic breakthroughs and experience. One very popular and powerful method that became uh, a focus was using the levels of hell, purgatory and heaven as your memory palace. So you would walk through the seven levels of hell remembering all the things you shouldn't do and uh, making sure that you you keep this in mind so that during everyday life you you avoid them so you don't actually end up really going there and then you'd go through the seven levels of purgatory remembering the, the things you need to do to make up to atone for what you've already done so you don't go to purgatory and then in heaven you would go through those seven levels remembering images of things you need to do to get there and need to believe to get there now this technique was um, very popular in Bologna and you actually see many works of art and you see uh, the Divine Comedy uh, written uh, by Dante there based on this art. And it's very interesting because some practitioners got more than they expected. There's actually records of people sitting and they're working on level two of heaven and for a moment, they, they actually felt they blipped through. They'd gone through to heaven. They didn't have the normal senses. They were in the pure light. They could see streams of pure light around them, but they were seeing from all around. And they could hear the angels uh, singing, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. And then when they came back to the uh, normal world, the here and now, they had to deal with this. And of course, there were biblical uh, justifications for such an experience happening. We see in the Old and New Testament people managing to visit heaven, whether it be Enoch or Noah or one of the apostles. So this became a very acceptable and very focused form of Christian mysticism. As time progressed, the Renaissance that started to appear, bringing a colourful restoration of ancient works and of innovative future thought. By 1484, the Corpus Hermeticum was translated uh, by Marcelino Ficino and the art of memory was about to take on a new transformation. A transformation 
which will be the subject of our next video. If you would like uh, to aid me in this restoration of the magical hermetic art of memory, make sure you've subscribed to this channel, that you're alerted of new videos, that you leave a comment and that you uh, purchase uh, my book on the art of memory which is in the link below. My name's Martin Fox, and until next time, let's let every word, thought, and action count.